Welcome, welcome. This is the Inner Enlightenment Show, and I'm your host, Laurie Schoenfeld. Thank you for all of those who are joining us live, and for those who will join us later on the replay. We are so grateful to have you here. I have thoroughly enjoyed hearing your comments and your thoughts every week, so thank you for engaging and being here with us each week. I am really excited as I have a dear friend with me today, Skylar J. Winter. She's the author of Pieces of Humanity, which is a beautiful collection of her poetry, short stories, and flash fiction. We're going to be talking about joy in expressing your heart today. Welcome, Skylar. I am so excited to have you here with us. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So great. So um, yeah, and hi everyone. Great to see you all here. Thanks for joining. I've, we've been talking a little bit and anticipating this beautiful conversation. So I'm excited that it is happening and here today. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're up to currently in the world right now. Um, so who I am <laughs> that's a big question I don't think we've got enough time for that <laughs> um basically um I Skylar is the alter ego of um a woman who likes to have a very private life so I'm her public face and uh, I came into being about four or five years ago um and through my writing and through perform for a need to have um a front to perform through or a character put to perform through and um yeah so that's kind of just a very very condensed version of who i am and um what am i up to well i'm currently writing book number two which i'm thinking is going to be fabulous i'm very excited <laughs> about it uh, i'm teaming up with the my um artist who did the cover for pieces of humanity and what we would like to do is create a beautiful coffee table book full of art and poetry um and yes so the concept itself has really come together for me in the last week uh, and so i've really been able to like really identify exactly kind of the layout the sections in it and um and my beautiful friend Neshka is working on the artwork and at the end we're very excited because we're going to have an art show because she's a very good artist so she'll actually have the pieces to sell as art and um yeah so we're going to combine combine a book launch with a uh, show so this is all like very exciting <laughs> for this year so um and also I have a novel which is kind of about four or five years in the making and I said that this year I was going to really nail it down and get it to publisher level. Uh, where are we? February? <laughs> well, <laughs> I've got my story outline and all my characters up on my pinup board that you can't see because it's in front of me. So, I've, you know, the first draft is written but it's a bit of a mess. <laughs> I've got a lot of work this year. <sighs> Your energy that I just felt, thank you for sharing that with us because I felt that beautiful, excited energy that comes in through creation. And that was such a gift that you just shared with us. Thank you. I'm excited to see how that all comes to be as well. Yeah. 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 We can't help but be excited about the things that, you know, we're passionate about. And um, yeah, it is. It's very exciting. <laughs> thank you for giving me a space to share. Mm -hmm. It's needed. Excitement's important when you get those beautiful creativity babies that just yes, come in. Definitely. What do you feel is a joy in expressing your heart? What does that mean to you? Um, I just think just in exactly the conversation we've just had, I think being able to, um, you know, so much of life is about getting jobs done and, you know, and the tasks of the day and the people whose needs you've got to fill. And that's wonderful because that's that's part of your bigger life. Um, and that gives you food for the, for the, where the joy comes, I guess. But um, being able to um, talk about, you know, your hopes, your dreams, um, your projects um, with people that really support and get excited with you, I think, that brings a huge amount of joy and you know that can be I know people get a lot of joy from singing and and all those kind of painting art all those sort of artistic expressions I think for me personally I've even just recently 
um, had a conversation with someone because I've been dabbling in some painting, which I'm not an artist at all, but I just thought, oh, I've got this picture in my head and it's kind of <laughs> painted with your hands and da da da. And I've been working away on it. And um, someone very close to me said, oh, wow, you, you're really, you know, this art's really like making you happy. You should do this all the time and then you'd be happy. <laughs> So I, you know, thank them for that input. <laughs> I've got my permission now to be as artistic as I like. So, yeah. now when you were painting, I think I kind of gathered when you just were doing this beautiful dance with your hands. Of yeah. take us to when you were painting in that moment. Were you thinking much of anything, or where where were you at when you were painting? Um. I think it's I think it's a lot like my writing in that I just lose myself and so I I started with this um, picture in my head which is certainly not like a standard picture it was more I think it's abstract I don't even know the artistic <laughs> language but um, so I saw so it's sort of like I guess the picture in my head was um, of lovers like I want this painting on my wall in my room so it was just like a silhouette almost of, of lovers but really long and big so literally I just feel like you know I just needed a big canvas and just my hands painting this sort of outline and you know it was nothing too not too many details <laughs> I don't do details so um, yeah and I just kind of lost myself in that and certainly yeah my first attempts are, are not quite there but then you know, that's the perfectionist in me as well. So maybe given that it's abstract, it's good enough. I don't know. I'll show you at another discussion. <laughs> oh, that I love the piece where you said you get lost in the moment. Just of just being. That was so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. My pleasure. So a few years ago, you were in an accident. How did you, after that accident, find your way to performing and writing or did you find your way to them or was it kind of a mutual connection there? Yeah, so it was extremely, this is like, you know, I'm going to use that word that everyone hates using, but it was very organic. So I was in a very, very dark place. Um, thoughts of like just wanting just any at all were uh, certainly there a lot of the time and because um, I had a family and everything it was also not an option so there was a lot of this passive suicidal stuff going on oh, if I just got hit by a bus or if I just off the train platform you know that kind of thing which is pretty grim and um, my psych at the time said you know do you like what do you like and it's like nothing nothing I was so disconnected from my body that I could feel nothing about anything. All I did was just cry all the time. And it wasn't crying from depression. It was crying from overwhelm. Just everything in the world overwhelmed me. Anyway, she said, well, okay, so what used to bring you joy? And I said writing. So she said, well, give it a go. And then from there I started writing pieces. Um, and then uh, a couple of years in, I didn't do anything with it because I was sort of writing the novel. And then a couple of years in, we moved to the hills of Perth and there was a little writing centre like, you know, two minutes from my house. And I took a deep breath and thought, oh, maybe I can do this. I've got to start, you know, start re-socialising myself. And, um, and this seemed like a really safe space. Um, creatives are usually quite a safe group to be around and this was a women's writing group. And so I thought, well, you know, worst case scenario is, you know, two minutes in I have to run home kind of thing and hide away again. And on the first session they said, oh, what do you write? And I was like, oh, you know, I'm writing a novel and I write this and that short stories. Never mentioned poetry because it was like, wasn't even a concept and then for some weird reason week after week after week after that I turned up with a new poem and they were like you didn't tell us you wrote poetry and there was another lady in the group Kelly Van Nelson who's um, a um, best-selling author she's got uh, two poetry books and some short story books and stuff out now um, so I met her at the group and she was just about to publish her graffiti lane and she said, I'd love you to come to my book launch and it's an open mic. It'd be great if you performed a couple of poems. So, you know, and so I 
I did that and then it kind of then someone came up afterwards and was like that was fantastic do you want to feature at one of my open mic events that I do and <laughs> so it just kind of <laughs> happened it was certainly not a plan but um and yeah and then just one thing led to the other which is what I love I love it when the universe just it it knows what you've got to be doing and it just pushes things in your way and and then before you know it you're doing it so yeah mm -hmm. Sounds very healing and therapeutic and exactly what you just needed in that moment. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And everything has been little baby steps. You know, it's like one thing literally led to another, led to another. And and so, you know, I could just take these little baby steps in finding my way back to self. And that's really that whole the whole piece of humanity is really about capturing not only my journey of doing that, but you know. Yeah, on a global sort of a scale of you know we're all we're all finding little bits of ourselves and trying to put ourselves back together even in some in really big ways and some people in really little ways so yeah I was I've been very blessed I love that Kathy I'm going to make your comment just said excited to hear you both huge fan love this lady's craft thank you so much Kathy for being here oh that's lovely thanks Kathy well, I would love to turn the time over to you, Skylar, for you to share some pieces of poetry that speaks to you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I've got a couple. I, I write about lots of different things. And, um, Laurie, you and I were speaking about this before we came on, that thing of, um, I guess, listening rather than talking. And the way that I've kind of approached that is I don't think people do well out of being preached at about things. I think it's more of a when you start asking questions and then you're engaging people, like a question engages, whereas a lecture just, you know, it doesn't engage. It's just two people in a room. Um, so a lot of my poetry has questions and things and I cover a lot of topics. So the first one I'm going to share is it's called My Grandmother's Chest and um, I wrote it late last year. Uh, because I have this massive wooden chest which um, I've had for many years but because we've moved around it's been kept in storage and it finally arrived back at my door and it just triggered all these beautiful memories of time with my grandma but also since her passing I've learned things which um, have made me sad about her life that she never shared because she came from a generation where you know people didn't share things like that so this one um, is called My Grandmother's Chest. My Grandmother's Chest, which I inherited at her bequest, has two grown men struggling to bear the weight of it. And as they place it haphazardly down in the space I've made for it, I know it is full to the brim of all the things that will trigger a journey into childhood memory. I know before I lift the solid wood lid carved with intricate designs that tell their own story, the things within are all that remain of a life lived. When I peek inside, her possessions remind me of holidays spent sleeping on a mattress on the floor at the end of her bed, feeling loved and content. The sight of her knitting needles conjure the click clacking song that could be heard all year wrong, long as she knitted and pearled wisdom subliminally into leg warmers and jumpers for me. I can picture the hot afternoon spent inside with the curtains drawn as I hold a small cardboard box with its corners torn containing two tiny decks of cards, one pink, one blue, that she would use to teach me patience. And I wonder if these are the things she wanted to leave me with. Did she really want me to have her treasured game of Scrabble kept immaculate in its box to remind me of the incredible vocabulary she passed on by placing letters on a board? When instead, she could have shared it, sharing the words she kept trapped behind a ribcage that should have snapped under the weight of all the horrors unsaid and packed back in the back of her throat that surely ached with the constraint of that containment. She went to her death, chest heavy, leaving me a heavy chest of things that tell me nothing of the life she lived. She went to her death, chest heavy, leaving me without the most important thing, her story. She went to her death, chest heavy, and I now have a heavy chest of memories that are only my side of her part in my story. And I am sorry. 
Now I know that what she boxed up inside her body that I could never unpack her chest the way I am unpacking this one taking each item with reverence and gentleness, examining, validating and rehoming it. So eventually there would be an empty space of weightlessness, an empty space to make breathing space in a chest that must have always felt breathless under the weight of violations afflicted upon it in an empty space to make heart space that would have opened her up to receiving the love directed her way but she could never trust. An empty space that even if filled with nothing would have been better weightless than weighted with the unspoken trauma of misuse and abuse she had to deal with. An empty space that would have meant she had gifted me her story to store alongside the memories I am unpacking from her beautiful wooden chest that I inherited at her bequest. Wow, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That was beautiful. No problem. Um, so would you like another one? Yes, please. If you'd like yes, to please. share, one, I would love it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so this one that I've got, uh, oh, gosh, it's hard to choose. It's always hard to choose which baby to read. Uh Okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with this one. It's called "How to Avoid a Train Wreck," and this is just a kind of look at life and and how we get into um, these predicaments as if we have no control over it. So I was kind of exploring that. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. How to avoid a train wreck? Have you ever experienced a pivotal point in your personal timeline? You know, that point where a pivot were possible and you could go back in time to do a retake, remake, reinstigation of events. You could prevent the train wreck that when you last track checked seemed to lay the track for the rest of your life. And with the benefit of hindsight, you'd do anything to put it right. Truth one, you can't go back. You can only move forward reloading characters, carriages, carefully excluding, occluding and removing all the detonators that derailed you and will only hold you back. What has been before does not make what is to come a fact. Best turn those creepers into sleepers, load up with believers and don't look back. Truth two, ignore people preaching hollow parables that you deserve to do whatever makes you happy as though any station named instant gratification could offer you anything but a short-lived flirtation and ongoing fixation with the percolation of dopamine in your bloodstream the point being you can only experience it alone making the trip pointless and hollow and once grat and cation are flying solo you're left with a big if and a tiny chance of arriving at the happiness chateau truth three it would seem we cannot influence the direction or speed of other train wrecks, each having its own structural integrity and moral GPS. Mahatma Gandhi said, as a man changes his own nature, so does the attitude of the world change towards him. A wonderful thing it is and the source of our happiness. We have paraphrased it to be the change you want to see and yet we still forget it far too easily. Truth four, choose fuel for your train carefully. High octane, me, me, me will cause trains to shear off at speeds which escalate the heart rate and feed the ego's need for power to subjugate, dominate and separate. Self-loathing and diminished self-respect are the resulting injuries of that train wreck. Environmentally friendly, me, we all travels more deliberately as though the journey is more important than the perceived destination and the scenery you will see when not traveling at the speeds of me, me, me will nourish every decision to be the change you want to see with a mission positive energy. For those thinking, I live my best life and shit's still happening to me, spoiler alert, refer to truth three, the only train we choose fuel for is our own. So chances are along the way you'll be impacted, slowed down, face a detour from a train wreck that ain't your own. This is where you choose what fuel you want to use. Me, we all is pumped on board slowly, allowing time to do a what is needed parameter check. Your moment of truth to consciously choose your role in that train wreck. Final truth. You will find pleasure in a plethora of stations offering instant gratification, but if you think that pleasure is happiness, you are misled, misinformed, mistaken. Happiness comes not from the pursuit of it as though the capturing of it will serve as a once-off fix at super hit that can be contained simply for the benefit of self. It is the result 
of putting in the effort to create deep and meaningful connection with those who come into your orbit. It is the consequence of doing a regular self-check and repeatedly choosing fuel that won't combust into a train wreck. Thank you. Where's your fuel? I, that was beautiful. And Thank I'm going to show you this because that was me too, Kathy. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Your words have such a beautiful lyrical feel where there's a rhythm and a beat to it, but also there's so much depth that's just relatable to each one of us in different parts. Like the one that you shared with about the grandma, mm. your grandma, I was feeling all sorts of different feels of different things I remember about my grandma and the different mm. things I found out about her journey later. So yeah, you evoke a lot of beautiful emotions. Thank you, that was such a gift. Would you like to share another one with us, Skylar? Oh, well I can. Um, this one is, um, so I tried to choose really three really different pieces. So this next one, um, trigger warning for anyone watching, this is um, has themes of domestic violence. So if anyone needs to switch off or whatever, please do, because um, taking care of yourself is the most important thing. Um, okay, so this is called Scream. And I've just got to get my mouse to be on the right screen. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, I just can't handle this. I've got two screens going for those of you, um, Laurie and I were talking about it before, <laughs> and I can't get my mouse to get onto the right screen. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <Now>. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay, here we go. Scream. A terrified scream is not the soundtrack to living the dream. Straight from nightmare, it conjures images obscene and pumps fear fueled adrenaline through the bloodstream. Domestic violence does not discriminate. It's everywhere like the condensate that gathers in the hot air of words we use to commiserate with families whose lives will never be the same because someone they love has been taken out of the game by a perpetrator who must be some kind of insane. Why else would you hurt the ones you say you love? At the funeral we ask, why did they stay? Why didn't they leave? We don't want to have to grieve. Why didn't they get out? We would have taken them in. We put the blame on them to cover our own sin of knowing but doing absolutely nothing. Because what do we do? We go to fundraisers, we, raise, we, sell, we buy raffle tickets, we raise money to raise awareness, but really we're complicit because at the, oh, sorry. <laughs> I had this committed to memory. Um, <laughs> radio. Let's just go back there. This is what happens. So this is part of, just, just as an interlude here, so this is part of, um, what I've been left with from the accident. Uh, my memory is is very, uh, oh, now I've lost a word, so that's it as well, because I'm under pressure. Um, so my memory comes and goes, and I have trouble with my short-term memory. So something that I know off by heart can suddenly just not be there at all. Okay, let's get back into it. <laughs> so what are we doing? We go to fundraisers, buy raffle tickets, raise money to raise awareness, but really we're complicit because all this doing what we're doing is doing nothing for that person who sometime this week will be terrified, curled up on their kitchen floor whilst a perp kicks, beats and spits and wreaks havoc on their body with steel cap booted feet. Why do they stay? Why don't they leave? Do any of us have the courage to walk across the street, bang on a door when we hear an abusive ruckus and free them all from that perpetrating fucker? Or do we convince ourselves we shouldn't interfere? It's best left to the authorities with all the right gear, like red tape by the truckload, which keeps their hands tied until victims get hospitalized or eventually die. Can we really ask, why do they stay? When we, not beaten nor cowed, do not have the power to get them away. Domestic violence does not discriminate. It feeds on blind eyes and processes that complicate, leaving victims without safety or a means of escape to escape situations which annihilate the self-esteem required to get the hell out. On a daily basis, we interfere in all kinds of shit that we hold dear. We leap in, take charge, boss people around, but when DV's suspected, we retreat to higher ground. 
whilst I've been entertaining you today, abusive situations are getting underway. And instead of asking why do they stay, cross that street, bang on doors and refuse to retreat from the child with the blackened eye and the cold bare feet, make it clear you won't stand by doing nothing for one more day. Domestic violence does not discriminate. Perpetrators blame love, not hate, for their violent actions which insidiously create hollowed out holes in those whose only mistake was to not see through their disguise before it was too damn late. And ours? Well, ours is assuming the abused are of sound mind, that trauma has not destroyed them beyond being able to leave the abuse behind. So I have to ask, when will we seek power for those who hold the victims dear? When will we untie the hands of those who want to interfere? When will we unite and demand a global regime that refuses to accept or tolerate one more terrified scream? Thank you. Thank you so much, Skylar, for sharing something that is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And I know to yours and many others of we need to speak up and share and help those who are in those situations. Thank you for being such a beautiful voice today. Thank you. I'm sorry about all the stuff ups and the stumbles. I, <laughs> like I say, sometimes my memory's perfect and I get through stuff and it's like, oh, woo, woo, big celebration. Other times it's just the So we are I holding just you. Mm -hmm. Kathy was also agreeing with you, what you just said. And breathe, we got you worth waiting for. 100% worth waiting for, and we're holding you. We're so grateful that you shared your heart and expressed your thoughts and your voice with us today. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Let's go to the inner child section. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> there's, my, there's my inner child. <laughs> All right. First question. What was your favorite thing to do as a kid? Um, oh, there were several, but I think the thing that always comes to mind about my childhood is um, we lived in a rural area and on the weekends, not every weekend, but many weekends of my childhood, we would go off into the bush for picnics and um, all around where we lived, there were all these amazing walk trails and everything. And I just have such a wonderful memories of, you know, my brothers and I would time ourselves on these walk trails because they were often in loops and, you know, and then we'd have a picnic and uh, it was just, I don't know, on those days, it was like there weren't all the all the, I don't know, the the stuff that isn't pleasant. You know, it was it's it was those days that just, I don't know, made made us feel normal. I guess, yeah. <laughs> made us feel that our family was normal. That you know, it was just a beautiful part um, part of our life. And I have really fond memories of just yeah, all those picnics and time running around the bush. So yeah, what did you guys bring to your picnic? Do you remember some of the? Um, yeah, well, my mum, my mum was a brilliant cook, and um, she always was making um, like she made brilliant scones and cupcakes, and um, she'd always we we were vegetarian, so she always made these fantastic vegetarian dishes that she'd bring along. Um, so yeah, just yeah, just some amazing things. I'm just trying to think of something specifically, but I just all her cooking was always so great. She did these beautiful um, stuffed baked potatoes that she'd fill up with, you know, so she'd cut them in half and scoop out the insides and then pack the insides with just all these amazing things. So um, they were just divine. Even now us kids ask for them. So <laughs> yeah. mm. That sounds like a delicious picnic. You said scones, and I'm like, scones and picnics? I'm all in just with that. But then you <laughs> added all this other delicious, and it was like a buffet, an Alice in Wonderland picnic buffet. <laughs> yeah, definitely. They were definitely a smorgasbord, that's for sure. <laughs> Second question. Let's talk Valentine candy. Do you have a favorite? Um, oh my gosh, just all candy is my favorite. <laughs> I mean, what can I say? Um, no, I am, I am a huge fan of dark chocolate, like super dark chocolate. And 
my special favourite is dark, dark chocolate with orange. Just, yes. Mm. You give me that and you've got me. <laughs> mm hmm Yes, with the orange too. We're going to tie it back in with the third question then. Uh, okay. What is the oddest food combo that you've liked and tried or you've just tried? Uh, <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed to say because <laughs> my my kids just go, oh, that is so disgusting. But my absolute, I guess, weirdest combination is banana, really sharp like parmesan or cheddar cheese and honey in a sandwich. <laughs> And it's really good. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I'm my gonna, biggest. Yeah. Go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try it. I have never tried that before, but I love all of those pieces, and they're all. They all have their own, like, very not potent, not the word, but very specific flavor. Yes, you have to get the balance of the cheese right. So I think it takes a couple of goes to work out which cheese you would prefer, that kind of thing. So because the banana and the honey is obviously quite sweet, so the sharpness of the cheese and the amount you use and everything you'd want just enough to, to take the edge off the sweetness but not then overtank it. And yeah, anyway, <laughs> I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Now you've got to walk us through it because now I'm like, really, I'm going to try this. So do you, I got to visually see this. I'm very visual. Do okay. you cut the banana slices and like place them all over your bread? Or is it like, you know, half and halves and you lay them out kind of like a hot dog type? Feel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So, so I just want to say as well that one of the saddest things for me is that I'm gluten intolerant. So I've had to give up bread. So that's really sad. I've lost this food. And I have tried it on um, various gluten-free breads, but it's just not the same. Anyway, so what I would do is I would do um, the, the butter and the honey, then slice the banana. Uh, so, and so on one piece of bread, I'd have the sliced banana, then grate the cheese, and then do another layer of banana, and then the honey, and then the other bit of bread on top. Okay. Do you have a name for this? Because it, it's no. a name. <laughs> I shouldn't think up a name. No, I don't have a name for it. It was just, I don't know. I'm gonna I, think my mom, no. I think that was one of my mum's creations. I, I'm sure I, I'm, I, we had them as children. And then when I gave them to my children, they buried them in the backyard and thought they were the most <laughs> despicable food I'd ever given them. So either I was very deprived as a child and this was, you know, the food and it was a special treat or I don't know, maybe I just have a very weird palate, which wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mom, I swear I ate my bananas. What is yeah. that in the backyard? What is happening over there? <laughs> what is this massive pit? <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, yeah. There's your treasure. Not the one you really were looking for, but. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, the worms the worms enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> that I bet they did. If anyone has an idea on what they would name the sandwich, we'll have a fun little contest here um, and see what names come up. And then I'm going to try it and take a picture and I'll tag you, Skylar, to yeah. see how this goes. I'm excited. I'm a little, I've, I'm a little nervous because I'm kind of weird about what I put together. <laughs> Like a lot of weird, actually. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> but I'm going to do it. <laughs> Maybe find a nice um, sourdough or Turkish bread. I'm not sure what sort of breads you have over there. You probably got loads. But, yeah, I think a nice Turkish bread would be perfect for it. Okay. I'm going to do that. <laughs> I love that. I can't wait to see. I can't wait to see the picture. This is going to be great. I'm, I've got so much to look forward to now. <laughs> oh, man. Fourth question, what brings you joy? Like a few things that bring you joy. Um, so things that bring me joy, doing exactly what we're doing today, conversation, connecting, uh, reaching out to people. I just 
get, I mean, it probably just shows on my face. I get so much joy just <laughs> out of knowing people, connecting with people. Sometimes I think people maybe find me a bit too effusive and too much, but I can't help it. That's just part because I'm just so excited about, I need to know everything about you. And I really, you know, it's not even that I'm trying overly hard to connect, <clears throat> sorry. It's, it's just how it is. I just love, I just love people. I love people's stories. I love knowing what makes people tick and not from the nosy perspective, but because when we have that deep understanding, it's so much easier to be compassionate, you know, not feel sorry for people, not make excuses for people, but just meet them on a very human, basic, compassionate level. And I think really that's kind of, maybe it might not be why everyone's here, but I feel like that's me so yeah so friendship connection they just bring me a huge amount of joy singing really badly at the top of my lungs <laughs> when nobody's listening also I enjoy that <laughs> um, and you know I used to love dancing but unfortunately since my accident um the only way I can describe it is it knocked the stuffing out of me and I literally was have been disconnected from my body for a long time so i find it now really hard to do anything like rhythmical so i'm i struggle with dance now so it doesn't bring me as much joy because i get to in my head about oh my god you know <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah that used to bring me a lot of joy and i'm sure in the future it will because you know we're always moving forward and things are always coming back to us and leaving and that's the process of life so um yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you, when you're singing at the top of your lungs, Skylar, do you like have a microphone or a pen or a brush or do you just, do you have moves that you do? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do I, I have my, my pen, my drink. <laughs> yeah, anything, anything that comes out. I'm a real, in, in the privacy of my locked bedroom, I'm an exhibitionist. <laughs> yeah, got the moves. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, There's a I have, I have fun with that. and yeah, and to be honest, like it, it literally is. It's when you know the house is empty and no one can witness it because <laughs> I'm sure they'd lock me up. But yeah, that's you know, <laughs> these are yeah. things we have to hide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always those pieces where it's just yours, it's no one yeah. else's, and that's half of the yeah. joy is that it's just for you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you get it. <laughs> I, yes, I do. It's, it's, good when, it's good when people get us get us because you know you feel so validated. <laughs> You're not so weird anymore. Oh, no, I see you. I I definitely have my my things and my little quirks that yeah are just for me. So before we end today, uh, where can they find you if they have any questions about your book your upcoming book or any questions at all about your poetry and different events that you're going to be doing in 2020 okay. oh um so i've actually just been working very hard last week i updated my website so my website is skylarjwinter.com so you can find um, a heap of information there and contact me and um, send me emails or whatever you like from there. I'm also on Facebook. So my Facebook page is Skylar J Winter Author. Please uh, shoot me any messages there or uh, any, ask any questions or anything like that. I will definitely get back to you. I love answering questions and um, that's fine. Um, and I've also got Instagram, which is Skylar J Winter Dash Dark Poet. And I've got LinkedIn and some other things as well. But my main, I'm really socially, so not socially inept. I was going to say I'm socially inept. I'm not socially inept. But when it comes to social media, I'm not fantastic at it. And I just find it really difficult to spread myself across lots of different platforms and find time to write and also have a life outside of writing. So my main places are Instagram and Facebook and then my um, web page. So uh, I can probably jump on here later anyway on Laurie's page and leave those details if people want. That's perfect. Yep. We'll put the comments down. Yep. Oh, I can hear myself. So we'll put the comments down in the chat box so it's an easy access so that you yep. can find her just by yeah. 
click of a button. And before we go today, Skylar, are there any last pieces of wisdom that you would like to leave with our viewers, whether it's life, joy and expression, art, anything that just speaks to you right now? Um, probably the probably all I would say is in actual fact, I know nothing. And there are thousands and billions of things I don't even know that I don't know. And so I find that helpful going forward because um, I've realised recently or, you know, in the last few years, um, it's really easy because of the way we're brought into the world and the way we grow up and it's no one's fault and it's not right or wrong. But the fact of the matter is we have this voice in our head which is all too quick to just start judging judging things that we see you know without even realizing it you'll be driving down the street someone will do something oh you you know straight away you go to judgment and i'm trying to hold and create more and more space to go just as i don't know what i don't know and effectively everything that i know i actually only think i know because i don't really know it <laughs> because it's probably stuff that's been passed down to me is it really my own learning um you know, then you understand that it's the same for everyone else, you know, and it's easy to make these comments, oh, well, if they just acted like us or if they just did this or if that person did that. But if they've never even grown up in a, in a, in a home where they learnt the things that we learnt, how could they possibly know what, what they don't know? Um, so I'm, that's really, <laughs> that's just big and long and rambling. I don't know. I just, yeah, there's so much we don't know. And with that, going, looking at the world through those eyes of, of actually going well I'm going to look at the world through the eyes of I know nothing I'm finding it it's a really good tool to use to calm myself and my judgment voice and be more willing to ask and to listen so yeah. <laughs> there's my sermon for the day my <laughs> sees you and loves it <laughs> so thank you it has been an absolute honor to have you here on the show, Skylar. Thank you so very much for your time, your heart, voice, and all the love that you've shared with each and every one of us today. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. And thank you for getting me on here and for seeing me because, um, as you know, it's very easy to feel out of step and out of place in this world. And it's people like you bringing us together and giving us opportunities to have space to feel part of something that's it's it makes a huge difference. So thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Love you. <laughs> Love you too. And for everyone that's been watching and commenting, thank you so much for being here with us. And for those on the replay, before we end today, I just want to remind you to look for the things that are working within your life as there's so many beautiful things that are happening all around you. Find one thing and just be in the moment, be present, and let that soak in for your day. Thank you all for being here with us, sending much love to you from my home to yours, and much love to you, Skylar. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for watching. See ya.